the Interstate Interfaith Center for uh, Sustainable Development just to frame our conversation. So give me a second to open that. We're part of the earth. A steward of creation. We have only one home. The concern about environment is the question of our survival. We're dependent. We're rooted on the earth. God planted the first human being in the garden. To be a steward of creation. L'ovda l'ashamra. To serve and conserve it. The Quran directly gives me the responsibility, I think in the English translation you would say stewardship, as Khalifa. Care and compassion for all others around us. Whether they have wings or fins or roots or paws. So it's called stewards on earth. We can all make a difference. What is needed to bring the transformation? If we can change our thoughts. Inner change. The quality of our actions changes. Not me. Not a few hundred people. We're part of the earth. Nearly seven billion human beings are survival. And there's no better time than now. Always think of my grandchildren. We have the responsibility of thinking long term about where it is that we are going. The life of the future generations. 50 years from now, 100 years from now, seven generations from now. What kind of world are we living in? To whom we owe this planet. Love one another and preserve forever this fragile planet. Harmony between the creator and creation. have to share it with all of them. Other people whose lives depend on the earth. Now and in the future. We have only one home. I wanted to ground that because those of you who weren't with us last time, uh, I wanted to say that those of us in Concord Quarter and the Eco Justice Collaborative are really hoping to ask all friends institutions this year to start a process of committing to transforming our property, the land that we control, into one of these three certifications. And we hope other faith communities will do that as well. This series, to orient you, started in, on March 1st with a look at eco-friendly landscaping policies with a case study from Kendall Crosslands, the National Wildlife Federation certification program specifically for what they call sacred grounds. And during this one, we're gonna look at the Audubon bird-friendly certification, a case study from Gwynedd Meeting, and the nuts and bolts on how to register with the National Homegrown National Parks. We have a third session scheduled for June, which is gonna look at protecting forests and woodlands through two Quaker initiatives, the Carbon Forest Project, and we'll have John and Joyce Monroe presenting, and a Cloud Forest Regeneration Project uh, that I'm involved with in Veracruz in Mexico. And then during this summer, we hope all of you will either volunteer to host a tour or take advantage of tours that we expect will be sponsored all across the, the PYM region, which is New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. And, and I hope if there are those of you who are not within PYM, consider hosting something yourself. So I wanna review quickly what we'll do tonight. We're going to spend about a half hour listening to a presentation on the Audubon Bird Friendly Certification. Then we'll have the pleasure of hearing about uh, Paige Menton's 
experience visiting houses of worship around the country and then a case study of Gwynedd's stewardship journey. And then I'll close the program by just giving a little of the nuts and bolts of what it looks like when you actually register for the national park process so that you're clear about what that looks like and, and won't feel intimidated by it. And then we'll just close with a reminder of what our next steps are. I wanna say a little bit about the Audubon Society. It's different from the National Wildlife Federation. Audubon has offices or regional groups across the country. So I've chosen one from Arkansas because they had their bird conservation director do the program. I think he does a very clear job. And then we'll talk a little bit about what our regional offices are doing. So let me switch over to that video now. So, hello everybody. I am Dr. Dan Scheinman. I'm the bird conservation director for Audubon, Arkansas, state office of the National Audubon Society, nonprofit bird conservation organization. Uh, bird con Director is a fancy title for ornithologist, which is a fancy title for birdman. And a lot of people call me Dr. Dan the Birdman. And I love birds, of course. And I also love gardening for birds. And in today's world, with so much going around us, habitat loss, climate change, and now pandemics, it can just seem so overwhelming. Like, what can we? do to help birds with all this stuff going on around the world. Well, I say we should make changes where we have control, which is our own yards. So how can we make our own yards and make things in our own lives more bird friendly? How can we make our space, our local environment safer and healthier for birds? And right now it's spring migration. And there are millions of birds that are taking wing to go to their breeding grounds to the north and they're starting to pass over our areas. And those birds need places to land and rest and refuel on their long journeys. And the birds that breed here need places to find food and shelter. The birds of winter here need those same resources. Our yards can be that haven for those migratory and even resident birds. But the problem is that birds have lost a lot of habitat over time, especially through urbanization. And I'll show you a series of maps here that show how housing density has changed over the decades, with red areas being dense urban areas. And over time, decade by decade, as our cities ha are, have expanded, we've been eating up what was once natural habitat or even productive farmland and replacing it with urban and suburban areas. Acre by acre, parcel by parcel, things have been changing. And this is where we are today. You can see that growth even in Arkansas. If you live in central Arkansas, you can see how it's one big urban corridor from uh, Jacksonville to Benton to Maumel and probably spreading up to Cabot and, and Conway. And Northwest Arkansas is expanding so rapidly. One of my birding friends calls it Northwest Arkansas City. That growth is projected to increase even more. So bit by bit, birds are losing habitat. We want to stitch that habitat back together for them. Because this is what a lot of that new development looks like. We've all seen it, right? Cut down the trees, take away the fields, put these houses down. Most of these, these yards are mostly lawn, and there's millions of acres of lawn in the US. Lawn is sterile, it's not good habitat, it requires a lot of resources. In addition to lawn, there may be a few ornamental shades, maybe a few ornamental shrubs and flowers, but these yards are meant to be, to look orderly and neat. They're there to be easy to maintain, to celebrate lawn as a status symbol, but they're not there 
to share our yards with other wildlife. If you are a migratory bird passing over this neighborhood, there's little for you here. You would have to keep on flying. We can change that, right? We can do things to make our yards, no matter what situation we're living in, better for birds. There are things we can promote and there are threats that we can try to reduce or prevent. And I'll go through each one of these in turn. So the first and foremost are planting native plants. Native plants are the foundation of a bird-friendly yard. Native plants are the ones that were here before European settlement. Currently, this is the main criteria for choosing landscaping plants, especially in the newer developments. Mostly, is it pretty? Does it look nice in my yard? And as long as it looks nice and it will tolerate the soil, the moisture, the sunlight, I'll plant it, right? But we need to balance that scale and consider the ecological values as well, especially the food web values that the plants provide. And I would argue that native plants provide both ecological and decorative values. They look good and they are functional. And I don't just talk the talk, I plant the plant too. I have an all Arkansas native plant yard. Now, I will admit that I bought my house from an expert botanist, Theo Witzel, who works for Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. He spent eight years before me putting in native plants, converting it to an Arkansas native plant yard. Uh, but I've enjoyed the last nine years maintaining that and adding to it over time. But I'm not saying that you need to, right now, rip out all your ornamental plants and go so completely native. No, no, no. You want to transition. You want to go over slowly over time. <laughs> when you have a choice, choose natives. If a tree dies, replace it with a native. If a shrub dies, replace it with a native. If you're going to build a new garden bed, put natives in there, or plant natives interspersed with your ornamental plants. If you've got roses and rose sharons and zinnias you love, fine, keep them, but do include native plants in your yard and reduce that area that is in lawn and replace it with more garden beds. And in that way, we can each create a little patch of habitat for the birds and help to create these corridors that connect the birds on their long journeys. And the reason native plants are so valuable is that they provide food for the birds. And not just the fruits, the seeds, the nectar that birds have evolved to rely on, but especially the insects. The insects are really the key to native plants. And even more than birds, insects are tied to native plants. Specialization is the key with insects. Most insects can eat only one kind of plant or a limited number of plants. Think about the monarch. Sure, adult monarch butterflies can feed on non-native zinnias and butterfly bush, uh, and all sorts of things that we like to plant for them. But monarch caterpillars can eat only milkweeds, and not the non-native tropical milkweed, but the native milkweed species. So if you want to have more monarchs, you've got to plant milkweed. And that is the rule in the insect world. And our birds need insects. 96% of terrestrial birds feed their young insects and caterpillars especially are good for baby birds because they're soft bodied, they're juicy, they're filled with protein and fat the birds eat. So even birds where the adults feed on seeds and nectar and stuff, they still feed their young insects. Hummingbirds feed their young insects and spiders. A study done on chickadees found that a chickadee pair feeds, they, they bring to their young 390 to 570 caterpillars per day. 390 to 570 caterpillars to, 
per day to feed a clutch of chickadees. It takes 16 days to fledge the chickadees. So 390 to 570 times 16 is 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars needed to feed one clutch of chickadees. And a chickadee can have multiple clutches in a season, and the chickadee is a tiny bird. Imagine how many caterpillars it takes to feed bigger birds like cardinals or blue jays or a pileated woodpecker. So native plants, again, harbor those insects the birds need. A study done on, the, on plants found that our native oak species in the genus Quercus, they support at least 537 species of caterpillars. Whereas the non-native popular ornamental ginkgo supports only four species of caterpillars. So if you are a chickadee trying to find caterpillars to feed your young, the difference between an oak and a ginkgo can mean the difference between life and death for your baby birds. So if you really want to feed the birds, plant an oak, or generally plant native plants. If you want to learn more about planting native plants, if you're not convinced yet, or if you want to convince your friends and neighbors, I recommend two books. One is Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy. He's a researcher at the University of Delaware, and he studied that link between insects, plants, and birds. And that's what his book is about, the science of that, written in a really understandable, relatable way. I really recommend this book. And then there's a new garden ethic by Benjamin Vogt. He makes the case more from an ethical, philosophical argument, how we are part of nature, not apart from nature. And it's our responsibility to help nature and to be a part of it and to bring nature to our yards by planting natives and not only just planting one plant here and there, but actually he likes to promote planting prairies, so diverse ecosystems in our yards. If you want to know what native plants you can find or plant in your area, you can go to National Audubon Society's Plants for Birds website. And there you can type your zip code into this finder and it will give you a list of native plants recommended for your area and also says which species of birds benefit from the plants and then there's also resources where you can find native plants or get help from folks who are experts in native plants. So I recommend going to National Audubon's Plants for Birds page and checking that list out. So the flip side of planting natives is removing the invasive species. Again, if you've got some ornamentals you love, that's fine, but there are some invasives that are commonly found in our yards that are really nasty buggers. And they don't just stay in our yard, they get loose and they invade natural areas. And government and state and nonprofit organizations like Audubon and Nature Conservancy and Game of Fish have to spend a lot of money trying to fight these species because they tend to outcompete the native plants in natural areas and reduce the biodiversity of our natural areas. And you don't want your yard to be a reservoir of spread for more of these, these aggressive plants. So things like Chinese privet and honeysuckle. And yeah, I know they provide food for birds. And of course, that's how privet spreads around, right? A bird eats a privet berry and poops it out somewhere else and the privet grows up. Uh, and honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle. Yeah, hummingbirds will feed on that, but there's also a native trumpet honeysuckle that's even better for hummingbirds, and it blooms at just the right time when the hummingbirds arrive. Nine are in full flower right now, and the hummingbirds have just hit Arkansas. And then Nandina, yeah, birds will eat that too, but Nandina is poisonous for birds. It contains hydrogen cyanide. So if birds eat enough of it, they can be poisoned and die. And cedar waxwings are especially susceptible to this because they gorge on berries. You can cut your Nandina berry stalks off before they ripen. There's also Nandina varieties that don't 
have berries that are sterile, but still, why not rip that mandina out and put in a native shrub that's better for the birds and better for the insects? In addition to planting native plants, there's basic needs you can provide for birds. Shelter and nest sites. Birds need that. If you want them to nest in your yard or seek shelter from the elements or predators. And again, native plants provide good cover for birds. There was a study done in the Northeast comparing birds nesting in native versus non-native shrubs. And it found that the birds nesting in non-native shrubs, they had lower nest success. It was easier for predators to find the nests in those non-native shrubs because the branching structure was more open, which exposed the nests to those predators. Next, dead trees, dead parts of trees. If these are not an immediate threat to your house or your neighbor's property, leave them standing. Snags, of course, provide good perches for birds. And of course, there are places where woodpeckers nest. When woodpeckers are done nesting in them, then there's lots of other species that nest in cavities that take up nesting in woodpecker holes or nesting in the natural tree cavities and dead trees. Uh, things like nuthatches and chickadees and titmice and great crested flycatchers. And then, of course, there's all sorts of insects that are eating that dead wood. And that's why there are woodpeckers pecking on that wood. But there is heavy competition for natural wood nesting sites because of people's tendency to cut down standing dead trees. So the way to supplement that, of course, is through nest boxes. And there's lots of nest box plans out there, different size and shape boxes for different birds. Just be sure if you're gonna put your nest box out that you protect the nest box from predators and that you have a way to open up the box so you can clean out the contents at the end of the breeding season. Leaf litter. Leaf litter is another great place for birds to forage. There's a lot of insects that hide in leaf litter. There are some insects that require leaf litter to overwinter. If you wanna have insects coming up in the spring, you've gotta leave your leaf litter there for the birds to find them. So here's an excuse to not rake, or at least rake less. Uh, what I do in my yard is, um, well, I'll mulch mow the leaves that are on my lawn, and I'll leave the leaves in the garden beds all winter long. And that don't, not only provides places for the insects, it also protects the plant roots from the cold. And it provides nutrients for the soil, and it retains moisture and provides compost and uh, protection from weeds, all sorts of benefits of leaf litter. And then come early spring, beginning of February, when the plants are just starting to pop up again, I'll rake that leaf litter out. Not all of it, but the, the heavy stuff. I'll leave a, a layer, a thin layer on the ground, again, to act as mulch and to provide nutrients for the plants and provide hiding places for the insects. And then I love to watch the wood thrushes, the brown thrashers, the white-throated sparrows, the towhees kicking around in that leaf litter looking for the insects. I'm sure many of you feed the birds in your yard. That's a great thing to do. Uh, of course, keep in mind that we feed the birds because we enjoy it, not because they rely on our food. Birds that come to feeders regularly are still finding a lot of their daily food sources from native sources, from natural sources. Uh, if you are going to be feeding the birds, just be, be a good steward and make sure to keep your feeders clean in order to prevent the spread of disease. So if you see a sick bird, take your feeders down and clean them. If it rains and your feeders are wet, the seed is wet, looking moldy, clean it out or even just on a regular basis. Every couple of weeks, take your feeders down when they go empty, wash them out. Now, some places say, use bleach. I don't like bleach. It's toxic to all life. If I really need to disinfect, I prefer vinegar and water 
or really just soap and water is all I use most of the time, environmentally friendly soap and water. So I can clean my stuff outside and dump the contents and not worry I'm going to be poisoning anything. And the same thing with water too. Water is so important especially in the hot, dry summer and in the freezing cold of winter, birds need water. Birds that would never come to your feeders for seed and suet and stuff, they all need water to drink. So water is a great thing to provide. But again, you want to keep your bird baths clean. Anytime it looks nasty, birds poop in it, you got that green algal growth in it, clean it out, scrub it out, put fresh water in, do it more frequently than you clean your bird feeder. And we want to remove hazards that birds face. Pesticides are an issue. 80 million pounds of pesticide are applied to lawns in the U.S. every year. And pesticides harm more than just pests. Birds can become sick if they eat insects and rodents that have ingested pesticides. And pesticides also hurt beneficial insects like bees and butterflies. And neonicotinoids are especially bad because neonics are applied to the seed. So when the plant germinates, it takes the neonics into its tissues and it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, plant-wide from the roots to the flowers, to the pollen, to the nectar. is systemic throughout the tissues of the plant, that neonic, and that is, is deadly dangerous to bees and butterflies. So check plant labels when you're buying in uh, retail stores. Make sure they've not been sprayed with neonicotinoids. Uh, if you're gonna use herbicides, pesticides, be sure to use them sparingly. Follow the label, of course. And if you can, really look for more friendly alternatives, like um, there are oils and soaps you can use that are more bird friendly. That may take a little more application to deal with the pest problem, but you're not gonna be harming birds in, in the meantime. And remember, the point of native plants is to have insects. We want to see insects chewing away on our plants and native plants can tolerate a high degree of insect damage uh, before they suffer from it. Even on the, the milkweeds that we love for our monarchs, we get those milkweed aphids, those orange aphids, the milkweed bugs that are orange, and the, the plant can tolerate that to some degree. So don't worry too much about it. Window collisions are a major threat to birds. Birds can't see glass. They don't know what that is. Instead, they see a reflection of the outdoors and they fly headlong into it. And they hit and they die or they hit, they bounce off. And some of those birds die later on from maternal injury. In the US every year, an estimated 1 billion birds die from window collisions. And it's not just the big skyscrapers that are gigantic towers of glass. It's also our individual homes where an estimated 150 million birds die through collisions every year. And if you think about it, you know, maybe your home, you see two, three, four birds hit your window in a year, but then multiply that by all the homes in the US and you see it can add up to a tremendous problem for birds. Fortunately, there are easy things we can do to prevent window collisions. And the key is to make the windows more visible for birds, to put an obstruction in the way so they don't think they can fly through. And there's things you can do like putting up strings, cords, decals, stickers. But whatever you do, you got to make sure that those elements are no more than four inches apart from each other. But he's found that birds are willing to fly through a gap of four inches or more. So if you're going to string strings, they got to be no more than four inches apart. If you're going to have stickers up, they have to be in a regular grid, no more than four inches apart. 
putting a decal in one corner and a decal in another corner is not going to do anything for you. Now, here's a picture of my windows, the ones that face my feeders, and I've got parachute cord hanging there. Uh, that parachute cord, again, is a visible sign. It moves with the slightest breeze. And all I've done is I've, I've put two command hooks, those um, hooks that you can easily remove, two command hooks on either side of the window frame, string a string across those, and then tie the parachute cord off from that at length. And then also you can see in this picture, uh, one of my two cats, but they are indoor cats only. And that brings me to the next point, keeping cats indoors. Cats are the number one predator to birds worldwide. Outdoor cats kill an estimated 2.4 billion, with a B, billion birds in the U.S. each year. Cats are efficient predators. They hunt even when they're not hungry. And they not only take a toll on our birds, but also on mammals and reptiles and other little critters. Studies have found that indoor cats live longer, healthier lives. Indoor cats don't get into cat fights. They don't spread diseases. They don't get mauled by dogs and coyotes. They don't get hit by cars. They don't get taken away by well-meaning people who think that they're strays and don't have a home. Take it from a cat lover, keep cats indoors. It's better for the birds, better for the cats. And then lastly, there are personal actions that we can take to help the environment. They're not necessarily directly related to the birds, but they reduce our impact on the environment. So conservation starts at home. Things like reducing energy use, reducing water use, installing rain barrels to capture the rainwater from your roof and using that to water your garden planting your own garden, have a local food, uh, not using pesticides on that, of course. Uh, so think personal actions that we can take at, at home to reduce our carbon footprint, our energy footprint, our resource use. We can also make our bird watching count for the birds by participating in community science programs like the Great Backyard Bird Count and Audubon's Christmas Bird Count and eBird. By submitting our sightings to these science programs, this is how researchers, how ornithologists keep track of bird populations, it's how we know which birds are increasing or de decreasing and how we figure out where we need to help the birds. So these are easy, they're free, and they do help the birds and something you can do each and every day just by watching your backyard birds. And you can also help to spread the bird word. So now that you know more about native plants and making your yard bird friendly, and if you read Benjamin Vogt's book and Doug Tallamy's book, help to share that with your friends and family. Tell them why you think they should make their yard more bird friendly and how they can go about doing that. And if you want a nice sign, a symbol how, that your yard is bird friendly, then I recommend signing up for the Bird Friendly Yard Certification Program from Audubon Arkansas's sister organization, Arkansas Audubon Society. Now, I am also a member of Arkansas Audubon Society, and in fact, I'm on the Bird Friendly Yard Committee that created the program. So I, by promoting it, I'm actually wearing two hats here. But basically, uh, on the website, rbirds.org, there is the application there, and there's a checklist of things you can do that go through the things that I covered today planting natives, removing invasives, taking personal actions. It points for each of these things that you do. And the more points you have, the more bird friendly your yard is. And you submit your application and you can either be green certified or gold certified bird friendly. 
and then you get a flag, you can hang in your yard and show everybody that you are indeed a bird friendly yard. But even if you don't have enough points yet to get the green or gold flag, but you want to start taking actions along that line, still submit your application. Let us know that you are on your way and we'll send you that pink working to become bird friendly yards. So everyone knows what you're up to. So when you start planting natives, people don't get upset about it, thinking your yard is going to the wild and that you are a, a, a visible member of our network of bird friendly yards in Arkansas. Oh, and also if you're listening from outside of Arkansas, you don't have to be an Arkansan to be certified by our program. Anyone anywhere is welcome to apply and get the bird from the yard sign. So I'm going to stop there because he has done a nice job explaining um, what they do in Arkansas. And then I'm going to transition now to going to the work that's done here locally. As I mentioned before, there's a new regional office for Audubon, which includes uh, Maryland and I think Delaware and Pennsylvania and New Jersey has its own. But they've just put together this short promo, at which is only three minutes. I thought it's worth seeing since those of you who are on might share it with your congregations. For over 100 years, Audubon has focused on protecting birds and the places they need, from rural to urban landscapes and everything in between. Our Bird Friendly Communities programs emphasize cities and towns, connecting neighbors to nature and communities to conservation opportunities. Each spring and each fall, hundreds of species migrate through our Atlantic Flyway, through your very community, and these birds, as well as the resident species we see year-round, are telling us they need our help. Facing challenges from habitat loss, exotic and invasive species, climate change, and a built environment that is increasingly difficult to navigate safely, birds are telling us our choices are more important than ever. And you can make a difference. Whether you're planting a container garden on a patio, adding to your garden, swapping out some lawn for pollinator plants, or managing a meadow or woodlot, your home can provide vital habitat and contribute to community conservation. Audubon's Bird-Friendly Communities Plants for Birds programs and tools are thoughtfully designed to make creating bird-friendly habitat easy and fun. Our Native Plants database helps you create a customized list of native plants tailored for your zip code in just a few clicks. You can even sort your list by the types of plants you love and the birds you want to attract. And the Local Resources tab helps you find native plant retailers and Audubon chapters close to home. Our Bird Friendly Blooms program pairs the annual Birdie Dozen list of featured native plants for bird habitat with retailers committed to having those plants in stock. Just print it out and take it along to one of our Bird Friendly Blooms partners. Each year we add more retailers to the Native Plants database and the Bird Friendly Blooms program, making it easier than ever to choose natives. Then take your bird friendly efforts a step further by enrolling your home in the Bird Friendly Habitat Recognition Program and joining a growing community of people across the region who garden with ecology in mind. You can create bird friendly habitat at your home in just four easy steps and it all starts with native plants. Seeds, berries, nuts and nectar from native plants are rich in nutrients and fats and native plants support native caterpillars and other insects that fuel bird migration and help them feed their young. Include fresh, clean water from a stream, a small water feature, or even a saucer filled daily. Add shrub and tree layers in a range of heights and textures to give birds plenty of options for shelter to rest, avoid predators and build their nests. And those same layers, supplemented with nest boxes, will provide useful nesting options for a variety of bird species. Food, water, shelter, and nesting sites. And you're well on your way to creating bird-friendly habitat. Your property, rented or owned, small or large, can have a positive impact on both bird habitat and your community, because what's good for birds is ultimately good for people too. And although our backyards are our own private oases, it's imperative that we remember that they are connected to our neighbors, the larger landscape, and indeed the broader global community. Together, we can all contribute to a ripple effect of stewardship that benefits people, birds, and the places we share. 
Learn more about Audubon's Bird Friendly Communities Plants for Birds programs and get started with our Bird Friendly Habitat recognition program at pa.audubon.org slash bfc. We've now been sitting for uh, almost an hour, so I'd like everybody just to take a second and stretch their arms and twist, just to give yourself a little brain break here. And we're going to shift and transition to welcoming a person in, on, live on screen. And I'm really grateful to have Paige here today. She's a member of Plymouth Monthly Meeting and a caretaker at Gwinnett Meeting. She's a teacher, a gardener, a poet. She's been growing flowers and food for over 20 years and has a per permaculture design certification. She founded something called Journey Work, which I think we'll hear something about in 2022. And she did that, I think, from the place that we all want to start this work, which was to provide hope and energy and a way to respond to climate change together. She's just published a children's book I'm excited to get a hold of for my grandchildren called She Held Her Breath in Awe, which is the story of Maria Sibylla Marion, uh, an early scientist who uh, we can learn more about. So welcome, Paige. I'm going to invite you to share your screen. Thank you, Paula. Um, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, my uh, my presentation is going to have sort of four parts um and i'm gonna share my screen now and start to show them let's see okay so um so i'm going to talk uh, a little bit about um this trip that i took to alabama and alabama's ecology and i went to alabama because that's where i'm from and I'll explain that a little bit about why I went and the meetings that I saw along the way. Um, then um, I'll talk some about what we are doing at Gwynedd with our land uh, restoration projects. And then a little bit about um, Journey Work, the organization that Paula mentioned. So um, my journey, on this began in, well, this part of the journey anyway, began uh, with seeing David Attenborough's movie, A Life on Our Planet in the fall of 2019. And um, I saw this, this film for me as a call to action um, uh, about dealing with a climate crisis and, and what I could do. And um, so I decided that, um, I was going to uh, walk to Alabama as my uh, response. Um, and I was going to um, talk to people along the way and ask them about um, uh, their fond memories of uh, the natural world. And that way I would start to understand um, different points of view. And um, so I started to think about that trip. And then um, that was in. February of 2020, and then then there was March of 2020, and so it got postponed. Um, but in the meantime, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, Gwen had uh, formed um, an ad hoc site committee and worked with a firm named Roof Meadow to come up with a landscape master plan. And um, so I was involved uh, on the the committee that worked on that, and. So a year later, when I thought about um, taking this trip again, uh, I was really, my my goals for it had changed such that um, I wanted to, to really understand um, the stewardship ideas that other meetings had um, along the way to Alabama. So I no longer needed to walk, um, which was a relief to my family. It seemed to make more sense to drive so that I could really spend time um, at these meetings along the way. So I traveled to seven different meetings. And so my, my goals were now um, learning about the, the Quaker communities along the way 
and how they steward their land to better understand the ecology of the place that formed me in Alabama. And, and still, I wanted to ask total strangers about their feelings for the natural world. And the way, I forgot to mention this, uh, the original plan was that once I got to Alabama, I was going to go door to door and ask people because that's something I liked to do when I was a kid and a teenager was go door to door. And so I was gonna go to, so I still went with that idea and I, and I walked door to door. So, um, so I ended up going to seven different meetings um, along the way, and um, they included Lancaster Friends Meeting, Third Haven Friends Meeting, uh, and then once I got to Alabama, Birmingham Friends Meeting, and Fairhope Friends in South Alabama near Mobile and Fairhope. So in Birmingham, specifically in Hoover, uh, the suburb I grew up in, I did walk door to door for a few days of a week. Um, and these are some of the uh, places I walked. And I found, I ended up finding that a lot of people aren't home when you walk door to door, knock on a lot of doors. And, um, it, but, but what I really came away with um, was uh, it was kind of more of a walking meditation about um, how uh, how private land is, how we use it, and how um, we how in Alabama, in particular, most of the land is private. Ninety five percent of the land in Alabama is privately owned. Um, it is the uh, worst, <laughs> the worst of the southern states for publicly owned land. It's less than five percent. So, um, so I did a lot of thinking about that, and I also um, took time before I got to Birmingham. And once I was in Birmingham, uh, it was really important to me uh, as I went on down to Fairhope, and then afterwards to really. Uh, get as much of the ecology of Alabama as I could cram into the trip. So um, th these are pictures from Moss Rock Preserve, which is um, in Hoover. It's actually down the street from my middle school, um, which we didn't know about at all. It wasn't a preserve when I was in middle school. Uh, it's 350 acres. It has a glade with rare species of plants. Um, and then uh, going south, uh, this is near Mobile. This is a pitcher plant bog, which is um, pitcher plants coexist nicely with longleaf pine. Um, this, these are images from uh, Dauphin Island off the coast of Mobile. Um, and this uh, illuminated, um, when I was in South Alabama, I was, um, uh, I got a lot of information about the biodiversity of Alabama from a book by Ben Rains um, called America's Last Amazon. And um, the, 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 a big takeaway, takeaway from the trip for me was about the biodiversity of Alabama, that it is one of the most biodiverse states in the country, um, fifth in terms of biodiversity, and number one in certain species, it's um, or in certain groups, it's uh, number one for uh, freshwater fish species. It's number one for mussels. It's number one for crayfish. It's an amazingly rich place. Uh, this was another pitcher plant bog, and that is um, the longleaf pine that I was telling you about. This is a glade outside. It's in. Um, along the Cahaba River outside of Birmingham. Um, this particular glade has the largest concentration of rare plant species. There's 61 species in this glade. It's the largest, it's the most biodiverse area in the Southeastern United States. And these were a couple of the critters uh, living in this particular glade. So um, 
after visiting these meetings, I, I kind of thought about the things that are going on um, generally across where I visited. Um, the, uh, the land is taken care of by a land use committee or a garden committee. Um, and the meetings that at uh, some of the meetings that I went to had environmental concerns committees, but they weren't usually this the same people um, as uh, the grounds in the garden. They weren't put together. Um, some of the meetings had caretakers. Uh, and generally, the grounds were taken care of through work days once or twice a year. Um, there were different kinds of gardens that meetings had uh with um not necessarily native species but they serve purposes like being peace gardens or meditation gardens um and uh i think the the big concern across all the meetings that i went to whether they had uh four acres or just front and backyard was um about the the, a smaller membership, the costs of transitioning landscape to anything other than what they already have, and, and the ongoing maintenance of it. And for some, it was um, that because I other meetings that I visited, uh, like Raleigh meeting, Charlottesville meeting, are in town, and they really are a house for the front and backyard. And so the city regulations um, also played into their concerns. Um, this quote uh, is from Catherine Reed from CELO meeting. And um, it was kind of a, and unfortunately my little stop share thing is in front of it. <laughs> um, so, but you can, you can see the quote about the Quaker testimonies and, um, and this notion of reciprocity that she talks about um, was part of the big of, of the takeaways that I took away from the trip. As far as thinking about um, stewarding the land in a way of thinking it as a, of an ecosystem. Um, and the health of everything on it, and not just the maintenance for our benefit. So um, the opportunities that I took away um, I'm sorry, I messed up the way uh, I'm, ah, anyway, a, a Zoom issue. Um, the opportunities that I took away from uh, visiting these meetings that that meetings can do uh, are as far as um, thinking about their land concerns is collaborating with other churches in the area, um, collaborating with organizations or with their municipality. Um, um, Third Haven Friends, for instance, was working with their municipality on a riparian corridor project. Have members with expertise train others. Uh, Charlottesville meeting had uh, somebody in the meeting who was a birder and was leading um, groups um, on the grounds and in the neighborhood around that uh, passion. Invite high school environmental clubs or boy and girl scouts to help with um, doing the work of planting, if you have a small membership or a membership that um, isn't as um, physically able to do the kinds of things you want to do, inviting other groups to use your land. Uh, Birmingham Friends had a group that was meeting, um, using their space to meet, and they wanted to have an herb garden. So um, Birmingham Friends had plenty of yard and said they could do that. And so both, both groups benefited from that. Grow seedlings and share. Uh, Third Haven Friends was doing that. A volunteer is a meeting to remove invasives on public lands or in neighbors' yards or in each other's yards. 
Uh, use meeting land or personal gardens to reduce area food insecurity. Uh, CeeLo Friends was doing that. Form a network of meetings to share ideas, best practices, and grant opportunities. Collaborate with peace and social concerns committees around the UN Decade of Restoration. Create a land celebration event for your land and invite everyone. And uh, leave your leaves, which uh, when it has experimented with doing. So um, now I'm going to um, just share some of the, the projects that we've been doing at Gwynedd. Um, this is uh, one view of a pollinator garden that we started a few years ago in the median strip of our parking area. And we did get a kind of certification, a master gardener certified certification through uh, the Penn State Cooperative Extension. Um, this is a view of the, the median strip, um, kind of like maybe a week or two weeks from now, early in the spring, and then um, the same garden later in the season. Um, so as part of the uh, land uh, plan that was worked, designed with Roof Meadow, um, we installed, uh, first we sheet mulched, which uh, the folks in the picture where they're standing, we sheet mulched with cardboard and wood chips to, to create an area for a new 